There we go. Welcome to tonight's Philadelphia chapter of the Society of Architectural Historians meeting. I'm David Breiner, president of the chapter, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Elizabeth Libby Brown. Before I do that, allow me to inform you about our chapter and its upcoming events. We typically sponsor talks and tours on topics related to local and global architecture and the allied arts and historic preservation. We're glad to announce we have an architectural quiz -o night in the works in conjunction with the Young Friends of the Preservation Alliance for, planned for January to be followed by talks on the development of City Avenue and electric lighting in modern architecture, as well as tours of modern communities in the greater Northeast and Levittown. We're glad so many of you have adapted to remote events and we'll keep that up as a great alternative to live events. If you have let your membership expire, please heed the reminders our board is sending out for you to renew. If you aren't a chapter member, but are interested in supporting us, go to our website, philachaptersah.org. I'll put that in the chat room a little bit later, philachaptersah.org. Or find us on Facebook. Membership is a bargain at $25 for individuals per year or $40 for joint membership and a discount uh, which comes to $10 total for student memberships. Tonight, we welcome Libby Brown who was raised in a family of architects and artists. Between that and living in Chestnut Hill and Society Hill, she has loved architectural history for a long time. Having received her BA in modern European history from Wellesley College, she returned to Philadelphia where she was a tour guide for the Fairmount Park Houses and a consultant to Historic Philadelphia Incorporated, designing tours and training guides. Libby was a founder and vice president of the Preservation Alliance, chair of the Friends of Independence Hall National Park founding president of Historic St. Peter's Church Preservation Corporation and author of a 2011 book on St. Peter's and chair of the local chapter of the French Heritage Society, a French American historic preservation organization. This talk combines those two realms of her interests as she explores the French roots of so-called Flemish bond she currently lectures on American and French history, particularly on Philadelphia history and Franco-American topics. Her slideshow may be partially blocked unless you minimize the thumbnail videos on your screen by hitting the small bar at the top of those thumbnails, which will appear when she shares her screen in a minute or two. So I'll repeat that again if anybody has that problem when once she shares. Also, I'm recording this presentation and we'll post it on our website for anyone who couldn't join us today or anyone who wants to hear it again. Please join me in welcoming Libby Brown. Libby, it's all yours. Thank you, David, very much. Uh, and I will share screen and um, it's just great to be with you all tonight. Which one, why is it I have two here? Okay. Looks well, good for my end. Okay. And uh, all right, well, thank you, David, so much for that nice introduction and for inviting me to come and be with you all this evening. Uh, this is, a, as David some, said, something true to my heart and uh, uh, and as I just wanted to um, before I get into this because he mentioned uh, the artists and architects in my family my mother did a, um, a drawing of a map a pictorial map of um, of Fairmount Park in the 1950s and uh, which I show you here, some of you might remember seeing it. She did it for the 
Fairmount Park Art Association and my one of my uh, memories of my teenage years was being picked up at school in Chestnut Hill and being driven into Fairmount Park so she could draw and I could do my homework in the back seat. And uh, so I, I, this is sort of osmosed into my life and uh, I'm happy to share this, this fascination I have with not just Philadelphia history, but history in general and, and American and French especially. <clears throat> um, sorry, here we go. So um, just quickly, the sources for my work uh, are listed here. You probably don't wanna read it all, but I do wanna point out one particularly useful um, source I had this Robert W. Craig's tradition, traditional pattern brickwork in New Jersey, uh, which came out last summer and um, uh, was extremely helpful in understanding the whole, uh, it was more about the, the actual brick making and whatnot, but uh, uh, some of the background of it. Uh, and um, so let's dig in. Um, I want to delve into the reasons why a cultural artifact, the prevalent style of bricklaying in early America is incorrectly called Flemish bond. And in so doing, explore the path of this craftsmanship and its craftsmen through the history of religion and society in France and America from the 16th through the 18th centuries. The re research I've done on this subject leads me to the conclusion that this style should be called Huguenot bond and I trust you will agree with me after the evidence I will present. So um, I'm sure all of you know what Flemish bond is, but just as a reminder, uh, it's the alternating header and stretchers of a brick placed in alternating rows uh, to create a pleasing surface, um, especially when sometimes the bricks were vitrified or glazed and uh, the uh, patterns came out even more uh, pronouncedly. Um, and uh, so this usually, this is sort of the, the basic uh, format, the uh, alternating uh, black and red, but sometimes people would include a, a lozenge and uh, or a diamond shape in the bricks or Sometimes they would have their initials on a gable with a, a date, which you see in a, a house at the corner of Fifth and Spruce Streets. Um, and uh, these patterns were, and others, were generally used for the facade or the visible side of a building. Carolyn Rowland joined the meeting. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the, the, so to show the skill of the craftsman as well as the good taste and wealth of the owners. So how did I get into this whole thing uh, besides living in Society Hill? Well, <clears throat> my husband Stanhope and I were driving through the French countryside in June of 2002, looking for the inn where, as our Guide Michelin told us, the top a little crust apple pie baked with caramelized sugar and butter and inverted onto a plate had been invented by the innkeeper's wife, Madame Tatin. So we're coming through the town of La Motte Beuvron, south of Orléans, and I screeched to a halt because my peripheral vision had caught sight of low brick buildings on either side of the main street. They were built with Flemish bond. What, in France? Huh, couldn't believe it. So after the delicious tartin, tart tatin in the next town called La Ferté Saint-Aubin, we went to look at the chateau across the street. I was intrigued to see that the earlier uh, circa 1560 section of the building was built with Flemish bond too. Now Stan and I had spent most of our married life together in Philadelphia Society Hill. In the 1960s, we were stored in 1816 Stephen Gerard House, and uh, which was a great project. Uh, and we lived there until 2011. <clears throat> As a history major and French teacher living in the midst of American history, I became a tour guide and over the years led tours in Fairmount Park 
Center City, and in the Historic District of Philadelphia. Early on, I learned that the style of bricklaying in early Philadelphia was called Flemish Bond because Flemish bricklayers had come to rebuild London after the 1666 fire and then continued on to build William Penn's Philadelphia starting in 1681. So I began to consider the fact that although Stan and I had spent four years living in Brussels, Belgium in the 1970s, I had never noticed Flemish Bond on any of the brick buildings in Flanders. And we loved to visit Bruges and Ghent and many small towns. And then when we went to live in Paris for three years after his retirement from 1999 to 2002, I deter determined to do more research on this subject. And here's what I have learned. There is little to no Flemish bond in Flanders predating 1666. We looked and could not find any. Uh, and you see here, uh, these two buildings in Bruges, uh, they are not Flemish bond. Uh, and this one has a date 1608 on it. So that's pre 1666. And there are a lot of brick buildings in Bruges, but I didn't see any. Uh, and uh, now on the other hand, there is a lot of brick uh, in France, uh, mostly in the center of the country where there is no readily available stone for building, but ample supplies of clay and sand for making their own stones or bricks. In this region of uh, the La Sologna, which is right in here, Oh, uh, yeah, I wanted to show you this topographical map, which shows this is the area I'll be talking about. And this is where all the stone is. Uh, and up in this area around Paris, there's a lot of limestone. So in here, there really isn't much of anything. Um, and um, so this region of La Sologne is, uh, is here. I hope you can see this on your screens, but this is the Loire River coming up from uh, Nantes down on the o Atlantic Ocean coming up through. And so then this is the upper Loire in here above uh, Orléans. Orléans is right there. And this area, the Sologne is just in here. Uh, and also another area called the Allier and the Bourbonnais, which are all in here. So this is where the bricks are being used in Flemish bond. Uh, now, in my research on the French origins of this style of bricklaying, I learned that the style dates to the Gothic period uh, in Northern Italy, uh, starting in about the 10th century and it spread into Western Europe. Uh, I have an archeologist friend who tells me it can be found in ancient Greece and maybe even Egypt. So uh, it's an ancient thing. So it wasn't, you know, a recent invention. Uh, and this is, I've recently heard some lectures on the Crusades and started thinking that the Crusaders who mostly came from France and England uh, passed through uh, Italy and Venice on their way to the, uh, the Holy Land and um, uh, you know, might have seen a building like the, the Basilica Santa Maria uh, Gloriosa de, de Ferrari in Venice, 1396. And there, uh, Robert Craig talks about in his article some, a few uh, castles in England that use it. And here is Lambeth Palace in London, 1495. But then Craig points out that it kind of faded away. There were just a few examples. So maybe you know, two or three or four crusaders built themselves nice castles when they came back. Uh, now, people often think of brick in France as being in Toulouse, uh, which is known as the Rose City and with many, many brick buildings. Uh, but they don't use the, uh, this, what they call the La Brique du Nord, the Northern brick, uh, because you don't see it in a, in a church as old as Saint-Sernin, 
in 1100 or you know in any of the other places so we didn't get into that area um, and they uh, and that is the roman brick that they used uh, uh, that had been there since roman times but there are chateaus in the late medieval and early renaissance style brought to france by king charles the seventh uh, the chateau du moulin was built in 1480 for Philippe de Moulin, who had fought in Italy with the king and saved his life. In these photographs, the use of brick and the lozenge pattern can be seen in the defensive towers. And you can see that it's kind of fuzzy, this photograph, and I'll have another, another example coming up, but you can see the lozenge patterns uh, on, the, on these walls. Um, and it is this uh, Chateau de, de Moulin is located near uh, La Motte Beuvron, La Ferté Saint Aubin in the Sologne that I showed you um, at the, in the first slides. Now, uh, when the later King Francois I continued the wars in Italy in the late 15th and early 16th century, he was captivated by the style and brought back to France an Italian architect to design his hunting lodge, the Grand Chateau de Chambord in the upper part of the Loire Valley. Uh, the architect may well have been Leonardo da Vinci, who according to the, uh, the Chateau website, uh, and at the very least, uh, Leonardo inspired it with many engineering innovations. And uh, limestone, not brick, was used, but the lozenge design can clearly be seen in the multiple, that is to say, 365 chimneys of the building. So if you look here, you can see there's some there and there's some over here, and they're all through these many, many uh, chimneys of the building. Must have been very warm. Uh, so, so this is where it starts in France. Uh, and oh yeah, and then the Chateau d'Herbeau, uh, which you see here, and again, here is the same uh, lozenge diapering pattern that um, shows up in this tower of this uh, late medieval, uh, early 16th century uh, building. So <clears throat> why would this style be called Huguenot and not Flemish? First, one needs to look at the political and religious situation in France in the 16th and 17th centuries. The French Reformed Church followed the teachings of Jean Calvin, you see here, a Martin Luther disciple and Frenchman who fled to Switzerland in the 1530s. It was the French form of Presbyterianism, so Calvinist, with el elders elected to lead congregations. <clears throat> its members became known as Huguenots or Huguenots and were generally well-educated people from the nobility and the bourgeoisie and craftsmen in the towns. They lived mostly in the center and south of France as well as in the Northwest. The source of the name Huguenot or Huguenot is unclear, but it may refer to a Swiss leader of the time named Hugues, H-U-G-U-E-S, in diminutive, diminutive form. So you know, like the diminu diminutive of Pierre is Pierrot. So a, a diminutive Hugues would be Huguenot. So uh, that's the best theory I've read about. So um, mo most likely. So this was the Calvinist church. And, and I think the Huguenot term was kind of a pejorative term like Quakers. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, they wore it as a badge and, uh, and it continued that way. So the wars of religion between the Roman Catholic monarchy and the Huguenots convulsed most of France between 1562 and 1598. Catholic churches suffered iconoclastic attacks, battles were fought, and Protestants were massacred, uh, most famously <clears throat> on St. Bartholomew's Day in 1782 in Paris, when about a thousand Parisians were slaughtered. And there were massacres elsewhere as well, in the Salonia, for instance. The wars ended only with the issuing of the Edict of Nantes in 1598 by King Henry IV. 
in which he guaranteed limited rights to Huguenots to worship as they chose. A member of the Bourbon family and King of Navarre in the French Pyrenees mountains, he himself was a Protestant and owned many of the areas of France where Huguenots lived, but he realized that he needed to return to Catholicism in order to govern France, famously saying, Paris vaut bien une messe, Paris is worth a mass. Uh, sadly, he was assassinated in 1610 on his way to the coronation of his wife, uh, coronation as queen of his wife, Marie de Medici. And you see here in this picture, this is his carriage and somebody's running up to him with a knife. Uh, and uh, he's known as the Vert Galant. And some of you may know this, the statue of him on the Yves La Cité, uh, just by the Pont Neuf in Paris and uh, a, a favorite spot. Uh, now, um, after a brief period of peace in the early 17th century, the subsequent kings, Louis XIII and Louis XIV back the counter reformation. So repressing Huguenots wherever they could. Uh, and um, they persistently fought and repressed the Huguenots uh, whose rights were gradually reduced until 1685 when Louis XIV revoked the Edict of Nantes. And here's an example of one technique of conversion or reconversion, uh, or as it says here, uh, la force passe la raison, force passes reason. So this is a, a Huguenot signing uh, his confession uh, or conversion that he will, he will become a good Catholic again. Uh, and uh, this is how a lot of it was done. So let's look at some of the numbers. By 1560, 1 1.8 million people, roughly 10% of the population of France, followed the teachings of Protestant Jean Calvin. By 1572, there were 2 million Huguenots. By 1600, after the, the massacres, the numbers went down to 1.2 million. By 1685, in the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, the numbers were, well, before it, they were at 900,000. And afterwards, by 1700, to 100,000. Uh, so these people lost to France, were either killed in battle or in massacres, or they reverted to Catholicism, or they left France to avoid persecution and seek religious freedom. And if you look at this map, you can see uh, how, you know, how divided the country was. So as you can probably see from the legend, this is the Catholic France in green and the Huguenot in purple. And then the disputed areas are in the yellow. And this is where La Sologne. So you can see that there was a good reason to leave from that place. And it is estimated that as many as 500,000 Huguenots left the country, going to Protestant countries such as Switzerland, Prussia, Scandinavia, the Netherlands, South Africa, England, and to America. And in England, king, the King Edward VI granted asylum to Huguenots in 1550. Indeed, the, the word refugee comes from the French refugié, starting in this period. And you can see here is a London, uh, a Huguenot church in London. There was a whole area called Spitalfields, which is where they settled. Uh, it took until 1787 for an edict of toleration to be issued by King Louis XVI, thanks to the Marquis de Lafayette, who you see here, uh, who during the American Revolution had seen many Huguenots succeeding in America and persuaded Louis XVI to 
do the right thing. So then why would the term Flemish bond be used? It is possible that the term came from bricklayers from South and Central France who fleeing the massacres in that region in 1572 might have found refuge in Antwerp, the thriving Flemish seaport where German Lutheran Hanseatic League traders had brought Martin Luther's teachings. But the religious wars with the Spanish Catholic, that is to say, Holy Roman Empire monarchs, emperors, uh, and uh, frequent iconoclastic attacks in Flanders meant that Huguenots had little security. Thus, for the Huguenots, moving on to England would have been a better option. And you can see here on the map, uh, this with Holland, Protestant Holland here, and this is the kind of the dividing line between Flanders to the north and French speaking Wallonia to the south. And Antwerp is right there. So, um, so this, this was all Spanish, Flanders was all Spanish controlled. Some Huguenots fled to the island of Jersey, just off the coast of Brittany uh, near Mont Saint Michel. Now, ownership of the island had gone back and forth between France and England. By the 16th century, it was a semi autonomous of England. And, uh, England. and in 1569, the residents voted to become Calvinists. So it, Jersey would certainly have been a refuge for nearby Huguenots and a likely jumping off point before going to England. So let's think about the, the experience of these, these craftsmen uh, in that time, brick, brick masons. Um, the traumatic experience of moving to a strange land where you don't speak language or no local customs is hard for any immigrant, but one French medieval custom may have mitigated it. For people in the building and other trades, there was something called La Tour de France. It was not a bicycle race, but it probably is where the race got its name. Local guilds called compagnie uh, would send their apprentices on a tour to parts of the country where their skills were needed, making stops in growing towns and earning the designation of compagnon by the end. Uh, and so here you see some uh, 14th century, well, they're probably still, but you know, kind of give you the idea of what uh, uh, their work was like. Uh, and then this is a 19th century poster, which I'm sure you can't see very well, but uh, it's, uh, it shows the different stages of becoming a compagnon and winning the prize for the best model or whatever, um, you know, like the master's exam uh, and uh, before the uh, becoming a, a master brick mason or carpenter or whatever. Um, so coming to America, uh, think about this. The Huguenot diaspora lasted for over 200 years from the mid 16th into the late 18th centuries. Therefore, the subsequent generations of those who went to England in the early years were well assimilated by the time America was first settled, especially Philadelphia, founded, as you know, by William Penn in 1681. He established it as a refuge for members of the Society of Friends, <clears throat> founded by George Fox in 1647. So we'll look more at Philadelphia, but just a sense of who was coming and, uh, and where they went. Um, whether coming directly to America or by way of England, Huguenots settled all along the Eastern seaboard and further inland. Keep in mind that these people were generally well-educated and skilled, that they could adapt and succeed more easily, whether they created their own communities or assimilated into the English culture. Some settled in Massachusetts, a few even arriving on the Mayflower in the early 18th, uh, 17th, 17th century, uh, they would have joined the Puritan church. Many went to Rhode Island, the colony founded by Roger Williams, 
which was based on religious freedom after he was banished from Boston in 1636 for not agreeing to Puritan rules. Many went on to the New York area owned by the Dutch and then the English with settlements in New Rochelle named for La Rochelle, the Protestant stronghold in France, Manhattan, Staten Island, Bushwick and Flushing. And in all these places, they had their own churches. Now in, the, in an area near the English Channel in Northern France, known as French Flanders, is the town of Hasbrook. After brothers Jean and Abraham Hasbrook left there for New York in 1678, they and other Huguenots settled the town of New Paltz, New York. Some of them had fled France for Mannheim in the Pfalz, P-F-A-L-Z, right? Or Palatinate on the Rhine River in present day Germany. The first official name of the settlement was in French, Le Nouveau Palatinat, which becomes New Paltz, Pfalz, Pulse. The town remains to this day with both Hasbrook's houses and other original buildings on Huguenot Street, still standing and well-preserved, built not of brick, but of stone the town being near the Catskill Mountains. But you can see that was a, 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 a you know, a strong Ingl uh, Huguenot settlement, uh, which is still very well preserved today. Now in Philadelphia, uh, in the years after the fire of London and that city's rebuilding, in brick, definitely not in wood, which had taken place between 1667 and 1672, Huguenot bricklayers who had then been in demand might now be looking to move on. Going to a place across the ocean where both work and religious freedom were promised and which, which according to Penn's wish, would always be wholesome and never be burnt was surely attractive to these Huguenots, especially brick masons. From the beginning, Philadelphia's many brick buildings, whether private or public, were built for Quakers in Huguenot bond. Excellent clay soil and plentiful sand in the area made bricks inexpensive and readily available. So let's look at some French names in Phil Oh, wait a minute, excuse me. Um, sorry, something jumped ahead here. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I just, excuse me a minute. Oh, something got out of place there, I'm sorry. Um, so here is Philadelphia in 1720. And you can see by looking at that view that almost every building is made of brick by 1720. So let's look at French names because that's a kind of you know, way to figure out if somebody's French, right? Um, because of their adaptability and assimilation, it is hard to identify these people with brick mason skills, but one can, can look at names and often tell if they were French. Oh, go away. In the records of the Carpenters Company, Compagnie, founded in Philadelphia in 1724, as a guild for the building trades, not just carpenters, can be found on this list of book borrowers, two early members. So this is uh, from the digital archives of the Carpenters Company, which is great to be able to look at. And uh, you can see in outlined in red, the name of William Garrig and another one, Silas Engels. Well, uh, there is a section, a, a region in Southern France called Garrigue, no S on the end, but uh, it, that's in, in sort of Provence area. And then Anglès would be, uh, has an ES on the end, like many names in Southern France, near Spain, where it's also common in names like Cervantes and Cortez, ES, EZ. Uh, so there's a clear French link there. Uh, some others 
listed in the in the records were there's the 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 French, the English, and the French names. So uh, Gary is Guillaume et Edouard, and then Englès. Isaac Lefevre was Isaac de Lefebvre. John Rowan was Jean Rouen in the city of Rouen. John Nicholas, Jean Nicolas. William Boyer, Guillaume Boyer, remember Charles Boyer. Uh, William Lenard would have been Guillaume Linard and maybe Jacob Libran and Caleb Moll. Uh, so all of these have uh, clear French origins. And there was another one who came with William Penn on the ship Welcome in 1682 uh, named James Portuess or Jacques Portuess, and it's that same ES at the end. Uh, and he was the, the builder of the uh, slate roof house, which you see here in a print and then in a photograph before it was demolished. Uh, and uh, um, uh, so yes, and so we'll, this is the slate roof house where William Penn was living in 1701 when he issued his charter of privileges guaranteeing religious and political freedom to Pennsylvanians. So that's Philadelphia and let's look at some other names in uh, New Jersey. Um, there is, uh, so New, New Jersey is interesting because Quakers settled in central and southern New Jersey starting in the 1670s. Many of their dwellings and meeting houses still stand. Uh, one likely French name among the early settlers was John Petty or Jean Petit or Little. P-E-T-I-T, -E and he was a brick mason. In Salem County, there are many Huguenot bond houses there, and, uh, and there's a town called Quinton, Q-U-I-N-T-O-N, and Q-U-I-N-T-I-N is a town in Brittany from which some Huguenots went to the Isle of Jersey. Admiral Sir George Carteret, you see here, that's a French name, Caltre, uh, was a native of Jersey and was given a land grant by King Charles II in 1664 between the Hudson and Delaware rivers. He called it New Jersey. Now you look at this map here, which I discovered online and it's, it's, it's like, wait a minute, it's all upside down, right? <clears throat> well, if you are a ship captain sailing from England to America, you're coming to the Northern route and you're coming down the East Coast and you pass Connecticut, New York, and then you come to New Jersey. And so East Jersey is here and West Jersey is farther West from that vantage point. So that's West Jersey there, here's the Delaware River and Philadelphia in here somewhere. So, um, so it's probably right there. Uh, Anyway, and this line here is the dividing line between East and West. And Burlington County is right here. Salem County, both of these we'll be looking at, is uh, in here somewhere. Uh, so um, then in Tidewater, Virginia, the uh, Georgian mansion Carter's Grove was built in 1751 to 53 by a brick mason named David Minitree, M-I-N-I-T-R-E-E. -E. His Huguenot father emigrated from France. His name was Menestrier, M-E-N-E-S-T-R-I-E-R. -E -E so young David built many of the buildings in Williamsburg and environs. And then before we move on, I just wanted to look at a few famous Huguenots in American history. And I wonder how, how many of you know already, but here we are. Um, in Philadelphia, Anthony Benezet or Antoine Benezet uh, came to Philadelphia with his Huguenot parents in 1731. He became a teacher of both enslaved people and boys and girls and became a well-known reforming figure in the Quaker community founding the Pennsylvania Abolition Society in 1775, the first in America. 
And in Boston, there was a silversmith named Apollos Rivoire who emigrated uh, in about 1720 and anglicized his name to Paul Revere, Paul Revere. And so the father passed on his name and his trade to his son, Paul. And then we have uh, the statue of George Washington uh, on the Ile de Ré in France, just off of La Rochelle. And it was the home of Nicolas Marcio, who was George, who, who emigrated to Virginia. Uh, he went to England and then in uh, 1720 emigrated to Virginia. And his great, great, great grandson was George Washington. So who knew? Uh, so now I want to look at physical evidence of Huguenot bond in Philadelphia. Uh, and these are pictures that I have either taken by myself or found online. And I tried to find examples built as early as possible because the style was in widespread usage in the Georgian style by the time of the American Revolution. In Philadelphia, it was part of the standard set by the Carpenters Company. So it was the standard uh, brick pattern. So in Alpha Sally, you've probably seen this many times before, but did you ever notice that these are all Flemish, or excuse me, Huguenot bond uh, houses along the alley? And here's the slate roof house again. And in this photograph, you may be able to pick out the pattern of the, uh, the bond here. And then there's Christ Church, and here's a great picture uh, of, uh, you can really see the, the, uh, the, the vitrified bricks in this picture and the steeple tower and steeple that were added in 1754, the tower um, is also the same. Uh, and Independence Hall, you all know this, but uh, there you can see, I hope you can see the brick patterns in this detail. Carpenters Hall, built Robert Smith. Uh, so this is later, but uh, Robert Smith did this as the headquarters for the Carpenters Company. And of course they were setting the standards in the city. So they had to show off their, their finest work. And here, of course, you see the uh, Huguenot bond uh, in the, um, on the facade of the building and it's on the, the south side as well. <clears throat> In Society Hill, you have St. Peter's, also done by Robert Smith in uh, 1758 to 61. Uh, here's a, just a plain detail of the south wall and then the east front uh, and the, and you can probably see it some on the north front, north side as well. Uh, some examples in the 200 block of Delancey Street, the Barclay House, 1750, uh, Climbers House, 1760, uh, the Man Full of Trouble Tavern, uh, 1758, and uh, the, uh, this house at the corner of Spruce and uh, American Street um, is uh, said to be the oldest house in Society Hill, which was settled in basically starting in the 1740s. Um, and then there's one curious exception, which is Old Swedes Church built in 1698 to 1700 by Swedish Lutherans and it's the oldest church in Philadelphia. The building was built with a Huguenot bond, which you see here, right? And then they added this tower in 1703. And here in the detail, you can see is actually not. It's English bond with the row of five headers uh, every row of headers every five rows. And, but what they have are these two lozenges and <clears throat> the bricks seems lighter. And I suspect that they were sandblasted in restoration and lost the glaze. But um, there is that pattern that goes right back to Chambord and uh, the uh, chateaus in the Sologne. <clears throat> Now I have some examples from going down the East Coast, um, other than Philadelphia, starting in Cambridge uh, with the Harvard's Massachusetts Hall, 1720, and Faneuil Hall, 1740. Do you ever wonder how to pronounce that name? 
Well, it was, it came from a man named Pierre Fanet, who came to Boston and made a fortune in the slave trade uh, in, and built this grand building in 1740, which is still a uh, prominent place in the Boston landscape. <clears throat> and you can see the, the uh, there's the pattern right there. Um, Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, and we know that there was a, a Huguenot settlement there. Um, and the Turo Synagogue, which is 1763, so it's a little on the, the late side, but uh, it's been painted white. But if you can see in this detail, uh, that, is, um, that is Huguenot bond there. And the nearby Old Colony House, 1741. Likewise. Uh, and then in New York City, the Francis Tavern, uh, which um, was built in, started in 1719 with Dutch brick. Uh, and it's, you can't really tell, and it's, it's not, it is not Huguenot bond. Uh, but then um, Samuel Francis started his tavern here and this grand, uh, I guess that's the north side, um, is, uh, is, is very clearly in Huguenot bond. Uh, in New Jersey, we have the William Trent House in Trenton, named for him, I mean, city named for him, and which uh, Robert Craig calls this capital city's finest pattern brickwork house. <clears throat> And then uh, in Burlington County, oh, that's in Burlington County too, but this is, uh, they both are, um, the Burlington Friends Meeting House. Now that it was demolished in 1786, uh, 1683 building. So we have no original, uh, you know, picture of it, no photograph. So this is the closest we can get. And, but look at that, you can see that pattern on there. And, uh, and this was an octagonal building. So it was must have been quite something. And I don't know, Quaker's kind of showing off their, their best, not, not very Quaker. Uh, and then the uh, Black House in uh, Jobstown, New Jersey, uh, built, uh, this was the 1769 addition to the 1743 house. Uh, and uh, William and Susanna Newbold built it, put on the addition in 1769. Now in Salem County, which is just extraordinary, um, in the southern, southern New Jersey, there are several houses extant in Elsinboro Township. The one on the left was built by Abel and Mary Nicholson in 1722. And look at that pattern, wow. And, uh, and then nearby is the William Hancock House, 1734, maybe you know, less than a mile away. Uh, at Hancock's Bridge, <clears throat> uh, and um, and this amazing pattern on it, and you see Hancock, W and S, I think it's William and Sarah, uh, and um, uh, 1734, and it's just quite extraordinary to see that still still there. The um, Nicholson House is a National Historic Treasure, so it is hopefully well preserved. And then coming south of Philadelphia, we have the Pierce DuPont House at Long Gardens, 1730. The, and on into Delaware, Newcastle Courthouse, 1732. Uh, and then moving into Virginia. Well, there are so many examples in Virginia, it's just staggering. But I chose Charlottesville because I discovered in looking at this um, courthouse in 1763, built in 1763, that it also housed a congregation called the Calvinistical Reformed Church. And one of its members, Colonel, Colonel John Harvey, or Jean Hervé, was a colleague of Thomas Jefferson. And I have to include Jeff the Francophile Jefferson's Monticello uh, first built in 1770, and then he did it over when he came back from Paris. And then his University of Virginia Rotunda building, even though it wasn't finished till 1826, just after Jefferson died, but it also has the same style, both of, both of his buildings. And then Williamsburg, uh, once again, here's a detail of the Capitol building. 
uh, the original building was built in 1705. This is a careful reconstruction. Uh, and it does remind one of the towers of the Chateau de Moulin in the Sologne. So uh, it's, it's, there's a link. Then on to South Carolina. Uh, in Charleston, uh, Middleton Place near Charleston, uh, this is the main house, uh, which curious kind of Dutch uh, gable here. And uh, But look at the brick. There it is. It's Huguenot Bond. And then finally, I just happened to be walking down the street in Charleston and I looked across this parking lot and look what I saw on the far side, a double lozenge. And this is all Huguenot Bond brick. It's really, oh, you know what? That slide that got in the wrong place. Wait a minute, let me just see if it's here. No, it's not. Um, uh, uh, it also, it talked about, I just have to recap that, you know. Um, Charleston was settled uh, by Huguenots, oh, cheaper, <laughs> in, um, I'm sorry, uh, I did this, this twice. Um, well, um, yeah, so uh, the, some Huguenots in, came in 1690 with a land grant from King William III to start farming operations in about 1690. And they formed their own church in 1697, which still exists today in the center of the city. And it is the only remaining Huguenot church in America. And um, uh, maybe when I'm done, I'll go back and find the picture for you. But uh, at any rate, that is uh, Charleston. Now, just circling back to uh, Europe, um, a couple of examples in Paris and London. Uh, here is uh, the 1635 Hotel Tuboeuf, or sometimes called the Palais Mazarin for Cardinal Mazarin for Louis XIV. Uh, and look at that. It is in the second arrondissement, as you can see on the Rue des Petits Champs. And this plaque is, says that this is where the, uh, the treaty when France turned over to America, the Louisiana Territory in, in uh, 1803. And so this, this place right here is right here on the, in this picture. Uh, then in London, it's a couple of interesting things. Um, uh, St. Andrews by the wardrobe in the Blackfriars section of the city was the probably the last church built by Sir Christopher Wren, 1695. Uh, and it was um, uh, heavily damaged in the Blitz. So it, uh, the interior is nothing. But I just came across this church when I was walking around London one day. And I looked at it and I'm like, I am looking at St. Peter's Church. And look at how it's the, the same windows here, 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 and here. And um, it has the St. Peter's entrance, has two entrances here and here. And here's one of them in this church at the, not at the west end of the church, but on the, what would that be? The north side. And there's one on the south side too. And it is in Huguenot Bond. Uh, Benjamin Franklin stayed in a house at 36 Craven Street, one of the many years he lived in London in the middle of the 18th century. And it was built in 1732, and it is in Huguenot Bond. And then here is a Huguenot church uh, in the section of Spitalfields, as I said earlier, the, the uh, Huguenot settled. Uh, and um, you can see its lovely Palladian window, and the brick, of course, is Huguenot Bond. It is now a mosque. And so this, what you're seeing in this picture, is the base of the minaret. And so, uh, so this is interesting to see that, you know, it continued on in England, uh, in London, and uh, in Paris as well. And so uh, this brings me to the end. And um, I believe that Huguenot bricklayers who left France came mostly from the section of central France covering La Sologne, Lallier, and the Bourbonnais. 
It was an area where there was serious conflict between the Huguenots and the Catholic monarchy in the early 17th and early in the in 18th century. The custom of the Tour de France could explain the spread of this style of bricklaying around France and thence abroad. And the term Flemish bond may have come from Flanders, but it seems much more likely that it came from Huguenot Compagnon only stopping in war-torn French and Spanish Flanders on their way to England and eventually to America, who brought their distinctive and elegant style from their towns in central France especially in La Salonia. Now more research needs to be done to determine the names of Huguenot brick masons who came to Philadelphia, but I leave that to other scholars. But I do propose that the name Huguenot Bond should henceforth be used because of its clear origins in central France, brought out to a wider world by Compagnon, French brick masons seeking both work and religious freedom as they fled persecution. It is furthermore another example of the close bond between France and America. Thank you for following the path of this cultural artifact, the style of Huguenot bond from Italy to France to America with some stops in London. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Libby. That was truly inspiring. Um, a, a real work of scholarship and um, so much of it really just done by walking, I think, and finding things, mm -hmm. which um, often is not so easy to do. So uh, I think we're really lucky to have had you um, talk to us about this topic, which is close to our hearts as Philadelphians. And uh, we really appreciate your expertise and your willingness to share this with us. Well, thank you so much. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments. Yeah, and in fact, I might be easier if people, let's try it this way. If people would like to type their questions into the chat box, I can moderate. Um, and if that seems to fall apart, then we'll just have a little bit more of a free for all. But let's see if people would like to ask questions. <laughs> Um, while I'm giving people a chance to type, may I ask the, the first question, which is, um, have you talked to, uh, to any Europeans about this um, discovery and what kind of, and if you did, what kind of responses did you get from them? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I, as I'm, you mentioned in the beginning, I've been involved with the uh, French Heritage Society which is a heart historic preservation group. And uh, one of my closest friends from when we lived in Paris is someone who gave me a lot of advice on this. And, uh, and uh, in fact, I think she may have been the first one that told me that there were chateaus in this, in the Salonia with, with his style. And uh, uh, so, and there, uh, they have a magazine published, I don't know, a few times a year, which, um, had a fascinating article about the Salonia and brick making that's still going on today. And uh, so, yeah, I got a lot of input on that side of the pond. And, and were there any, was there anyone who disagreed with your theory? Um, actually, Robert Craig does, but, oh. but yeah, I've had some conversation with him and he kind of brushed me aside. But anyway, I um, hopefully I haven't sent him a copy of my article that I wrote that I based this talk on, but, mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, we'll see what he says, but um, so, and particularly uh, uh, Jean Petit, and oh, I left that out. I've decided that the, um, those three, the Burlington County, uh, the Burlington uh, Friends Meeting and the, the two Salem County houses are such flamboyant use of the brick making that they must have been French. They could not have been Quaker. Right, <laughs> right. The the Huguenot uh, masons or their progeny might not have had the same limits on on their exuberance that the that the Quakers would have had. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. Um, so. Oh, okay. First question from Carolyn uh, Klepser: Was there any connection of those journeymen to the Order of Masons? Oh my goodness. I don't know, probably, but um, does anybody else know? That's a really interesting question. I mean, presumably Masons, you know. In fact, that, that 19th century lithograph 
uh, I think did show people in Masonic uh, uniforms. So maybe yes. Um, if, if people would like to turn their cameras on, um, that would, you're perfectly invited to do that. Yes, um, do. We don't have to be so anonymous uh, as we are right now. Oh, great. Now a whole, whole bunch of more questions. Um, has anyone else written about this theory before? George McNeely asks. Um, not, well, uh, let's see, there was uh, an article on, uh, yeah, well, not, not in as much detail and as with this sort of historical context that uh, I put it into, but uh, I found a very interesting article online um, uh, by, let's see, what was that organization? <laughs> Uh, somebody named Calder Loth, and he does a whole study of the um, uh, Virginia houses, and there are just so many examples. And he calls the term Flemish bond a misnomer, mm -hmm. but he doesn't take it anywhere. So it's, I, I think other people have, you know, noticed that, but um, I don't think anybody's made the historic connections. Mm -hmm. Well, it may be that a lot of architectural historians don't have the same uh, bona fides you do in terms of French culture and the ability well, to track down things that you've mentioned well, the today. History, which I love so much. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, Jay asks, oh, it's comments, excellent talk, and then asks, have you compared similar types of brickwork in Northern Europe, such as the Frauenkirche in Munich? Mm -hmm. built in 1460s to 80s mm -hmm. as written about by Calder Loth in an article for ICAA. Okay, that's what it was, ICAA, mm -hmm. yeah. That's what you're referring to, yeah. Right, right. Um, Jay yeah. always knows more than what we know. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna show your face, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I know there are examples, I didn't go into them, but um, you know, there was a huge number of Huguenots who went to Prussia uh, because that was Lutheran, and they they and they made a huge contribution, and I think there are a lot of examples in Germany, uh, in that in that Prussian area. Yeah, I find it cool. odd that, yeah. as you point yeah. out, this this brick style is so prevalent in early in early American architecture on the East Coast, and yet it. It, it's not been very thoroughly documented. Well, I think it's because the, the Huguenots assimilated so much mm. and so well and, and it extended over that long period of time that, that it, it's right. They, it, it, you know, all these Huguenot, these French names that suddenly like, oh, Paul Revere, you know, is, that's French. And it just got totally assimilated. And some of them before they came you know, they lived in England for a while and then came, you know, by then they were pretty well assimilated, like um, uh, James Portuess, and sometimes it's written Porteous, but that's not correct. Mm -hmm. uh, but he apparently was born in England, so uh, his his parents would have been the, the immigrants. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, George has another question. Are there any other examples in the U.S. of the particularly extravagant brickwork that we see in Salem County? I'm not aware of any. Um, if anybody else is, I would love to know. But, uh, mm -hmm. but as you know, it really is concentrated along the East Coast. We it's all just have to that, that that the elaborateness of that is I mean, I know. It's, it's so <laughs> unusual. I mean, partly it's perhaps that it's actually survived because it's such a weird. Sorry to jump in here. Dan, no, please, please, that's fine. But I mean, it's it, it's such a weirdly isolated corner of the world. I know it was um, so incredible to find it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny when I was at GFS, I remember we took an architectural tour there. That oh, was really? A million years ago. <laughs> and so but, we marched around to all those houses. It was absolutely oh, really? oh, great. So it was a Quaker Quaker settlement. Was that the, the focus of it? Or I, I think it was because of because of the bicentennial, which I guess was sure. my sort of 10th grade or something. I think it was just sure. that we had various tours. I did a tour of I led as a 10th grader a tour of Society Hill. Oh, I'm oh, getting off the <laughs> 
Carrie Bryan writes, this was such an exciting talk for me. I served at Fairmount Park Historic House Guide, usually yeah. based at Laurel Hill Mansion for four years. I use the term, quote, Flemish bond, end quote, without questioning the origin of this descriptor. Yes, Carrie, almost everybody does that apparently. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, and um, Steve Peitzman writes, I would, uh, I would think that for a, a wall two bricks deep, the bond, Flemish or Huguenot, uh, seems perhaps natural. Simultaneous invention is not uncommon. Could the bond be of multiple origins? You know, but perhaps, I mean, it's like, you know, messing around with making a, a strong wall and I don't know anything about, you know, brick construction particularly. So um, I'm no expert on that, but uh, uh, oh dear, I had somebody, an architect here at Cathedral Village who gave, told me something about that. Now I can't remember what he said, but anyway, um, you yeah, know, but it, it seems such a, uh, um, pleasing surface that, uh, and it's probably fairly simple. I mean, I guess it's more complicated than just, you know, straight bricks all the way through, but not as strong. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's for the strength of the wall as well as the, the appearance. Right. Well, you made it, you Jay's made a, a very good case. I'm sorry, George, go ahead. I was saying Jay's now exposed his camera, so he probably knows all about brick. Yeah, work. Jay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm ribbing him in the <laughs> I'll shut up. Now. Let me just make a couple of comments. First of all, it is great to see you, Libby. It's great to I see you. I remember warmly the great Christmas parties uh, Dan used to give. Yeah. And still have that little keg of what was it, brandy? What was Gary. that? Yes. Oh, for My sure. Son has it. <laughs> oh, that's that was wonderful. I get, I get occasional <laughs> infusions from him. Okay. Well, uh, I, I'm thinking of many, many years ago in the 20s for the Pennsylvania Magazine of Hor History and Biography, uh, you have uh, Harold Gillingham. He used to write a lot on these historical subjects. Mm -hmm. He wrote about early Philadelphia brickmakers, the Coates family and other, mm -hmm. other early brickmakers. I don't think he, he got into different bonding techniques. Uh, I will tell you a funny story, though about my first discovery of Flemish bond. Now, those of you who know Bob St. George, who used to teach at Penn, maybe still does. Bob used to live across the street from me 50 years ago. I still live here. Anyway, so we used to get together on many occasions, talking deep into the evening and early morning hours on Philadelphia history and the like. And he brought up the subject of Flemish bond. And I said, what is that? And he says, well, I'll show you. So we drove down, this was about two o'clock in the morning <laughs> to Third and Delancey. And we're out there on the street corner, middle of the night, nobody else there. And he's pointing out to me, Flemish bond over here versus English bond over here. And suddenly a spotlight from a police car shines on us. <laughs> and the policeman says, what do you two think you are doing? And I just said, oh, my friend here was pointing out to me the distinction between English bond and Flemish bond brick. And the policeman said, oh, that's fine. <laughs> but had I told him Huguenot bond, it may have may have resulted in, in a different email. Right. <laughs> right. Could I uh, offer an observation? I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I've been trying to... Uh, write a message in the chat bar, and I seem to be unable to transmit it. But uh, Just hit I, enter. I, well, I'd like to say that uh, on my mother's side, uh, my ancestors were Huguenots. And the name yeah. in France was L-E-V-E-N-T. Here, they use Levan, L-E-V-A-N. Yeah. Uh, they arrived in Berks County uh, by 1727. Some of them came earlier than that. Uh, they fled from Picardy um, around um, the towns of Vervin and uh, Lone and Soissons. Hmm. Uh, they went first to Amsterdam, then to Hockenheim, Germany, and ultimately to Pennsylvania. Hmm. And now the area where they came from in Picardy, which is, as you know, is in the north, uh, mm -hmm. uh, they came from an area not far from what is now the Belgian border. 
And that area is called the Tirosh. Hmm. And it's noted for fortified churches. Hmm. Uh, that is uh, the area where Germanic uh, people, uh, aggressors, uh, invaded from early times into France. Uh, they did it again in 1870, they did it in 1914, they did it in 1940. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the uh, Roman churches, they're so called, that were built there in the latter years of the Roman Empire, uh, over time, because of these constant invasions and the villagers fleeing to the churches, which were the most substantial structures around for shelter, they started to fortify these churches. Mm. And, and the Tirash is known as the region of uh, uh, Les Eglis Fortifay, mm. uh, fortified churches. And uh, I've toured there extensively. And um, the red, red brick there, the, the soil is suitable for brick making, um, clearly resembles uh, the, uh, the uh, patterns and things that uh, you have found here. Huh. And in fact, some of the, um, and somebody raised the question about Masonic symbolism, some of the designs in, in, in the brick walls are said to have been Masonically inspired. I don't think they were. Hmm. But anyway, um, uh, so that's an area where uh, there was a, a, a concentration of Huguenots and, uh, and, uh, and brick making and brick structures were very characteristic of the area. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you for that. Yeah. As living in Belgium for four years, we were very, very aware of that whole uh, Germanic push from the Rhine down, you know, through Flanders and, and uh, you know, that whole, and the dividing line between uh, the Flemish speaking and uh, Walloon speaking or French speaking people in Belgium was the line um, where the Romans retreated from the Rhine River at a certain point and then built a wall. Uh, and it was the German tribes who came over the, the Rhine or the Scheldt and settled in there. So as Flemish is a Dutch German language. And then the Romans, of course, was a uh, a romance, uh, the French was a romance, Roman language, so, yeah. From which I descend on uh, on that side of my family, um, uh, were married in Amsterdam. Uh, both of their families had fled from uh, uh, Picardy. And uh, so I've had my DNA done. And uh, those people there were French in nationality. Of course, that that part of France at one time was, was uh, uh, ruled by England. Uh, mm. And then of course, the Norman invasion, and we all know that story. Uh, but uh, my uh, DNA uh, test proves distinctly that those people, though they may have been French in nationality, uh, were not Gallic. They were Nordic mm. in origin. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, very good. Uh, oh, Joanne Beam is here. Hi, Joanne. Okay, well, listen, uh, well, thanks. For, for those of you who are still with us, which is almost everyone, uh, if you would like to turn on your camera and, and wave to Libby as a, as a sign of thank you for her tremendous presentation, that would be wonderful. Um, Libby, we, um, we really, this was a, a really special treat. Um, I'm glad some of your friends came, some of our old time members came and uh, we all learned a lot about an interesting subject. So thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Let's hear it for the Huguenots. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Katrina. <laughs> Thanks again. Great. Thank you all very much Bye. for coming. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you.